Hello, everyone. So we're going to talk about STO and Cilium today. So starting with quick intro. Hey, my name is Ahmed Bebars. I'm a software engineer at the New York Times. I do Scuba, I do AWS, I do Gover, and I joined here with Pete. Hi, I'm Pete. I'm also an engineer here at the Times. Um, it's an honor to be here. I'm super excited to give this talk. Uh, I'm from Brooklyn, New York. Um, you know, this is my first KubeCon, so I'm super excited. We'll make it fun. So, so I was thinking how to start this talk, and like uh, this quote for Albert Einstein caught me, which is, out of complexity, find simplicity. Like usually as engineers, most of the time we try to find the best working solution, but over time it gets more complicated. And then like when we w talk networking, more complications, more problem, more debugging, more you spend your time trying to figure out what the hell went wrong in my stack. So today we are walking through how we started to build a platform in the New York Times and transition from like one step at a time to make things simpler in a good way. So here's our agenda for today. Uh, we'll talk about the multi-tenant cluster foundation. Gave talk about this before, but like we'll just uh, get the foundations sorted out. We'll talk about our day one setup, how we started the platform and uh, set all of our tenants with their networking stack and runtime. And then we'll hand it over to Beat. We'll talk about Cilium and eBBF, and then we'll close with the takeaways. So starting with our platform. So we host our platform on a multi-tenant architecture. What I mean by that, we have clusters that host all of our runtime for our tenants. Mean by tenants, customer engineering, which product engineering teams have services that they need to build uh, on the platform. So each team will get their own cloud accounts, which will get connected with our clusters. We have a multi-regional clusters across multiple environment and all of this based on Kubernetes. So that's how teams get their runtime access and build their deployments. Now talk about the CNI and network addresses. One of the things that I want to mention here, because we are using a multi-tenant uh, architecture, we want to ensure that we have all of our uh, IB addresses are up to the stack. So like we are not running into IB exhaustion, all of the kind of layers. So you can see here that we are using like the same class for all of our resources across all of our cloud accounts. That's for the nodes. And then we transition from like the 10 class to the 100 class for our Cilium bots. That gives us like a good way of like not running towards IB exhaustion in our clusters. So basically like we have a translation between the node layer and the buds layer. Now we'll talk about strict isolation. So clusters are very isolated per tenant. So we have a multi-tenant, but each tenant run different kind of workloads. So when we deploy for a tenant uh, as a service, they get a specific namespace. They can get one or more namespaces. By default, they get one namespace, and this namespace is isolated from other namespaces. So they can talk to each other by default, and this is how we built it, to ensure that all of this is stricted between namespaces, and then we will talk more about like how we can open things between different namespaces. Another benefit of using Cilium and network policies is that we can apply like cluster-wide policies across uh, workloads. So we're talking about like tenant namespace by default, like they get access to STU namespaces, for example, which like that allow like all of the sidecars to communicate with STUD and like with ingress gateway and other things. But also on the other side, we can see like we need to do all of the DNS lookups and all of the other things happen in the cube system. So these all default policies that get applied to the cluster. So that's the foundation. Let's talk more about like our day one setup or how like the platform started with the multi-tenant architecture. So this is our ingress layer. Traffic comes from a DNS perspective, hits like wherever 
provider that we are using Route 53, for example, and then goes to an external ingress load balancer that heads first to our first layer of ingress, which is our envoy. So you can see this, like there's a multi load balancers in between, but this was purposely built that way as a first step. So we can ensure that we have like a publicly ingress and then we have a private ingress, but like makes the setup really complex. So you get like from a DNS to a load balancer to envoy to another load balancer to envoy to the workload. So that works where we can like expose different criteria for the first load balancer, make the second one internal, but also complicate the process. And you can see like we have multiple envoys in the picture here, makes the setup a little bit complex. I'll talk why later. And then we talk about the mesh. And that's how we built Istio uh, in the first iteration. So in the first iteration, we have like, I talked earlier, we have regional clusters. So the regional clusters are east and west. And then we, to ensure communication between east and west cluster, we have to install like uh, load balancers between two regions and all of the communication between workloads goes in that direction. So we have nodes, buds, STU sidecars, and when they start to want to communicate with another bud on the other side of the world, which is in the west region, they have to go through the STU uh, gateway. So like traffic traverse through a multiple layer. And like you can see from the previous ingress layer and from the mesh setup, we have a lot of load balancers and STU sidecars and envoy. And like the setup here seems a little bit complex and we were trying to like make it work at the first iteration, but then look forward into how to simplify this. And here I'll hand it off to Beat. He'll talk about like how are we doing this with Cilium and eBBF. Thanks, Ahmed. Uh, I'm gonna pick up where Ahmed left off and talk about our current configuration and how we're leaning into Cilium and eBBF. This is a more holistic view of our network stack. Um, our friends at Istio, Cilium, and AWS are continuously improving and adding new features to their offerings. However, that also means there's more overlap between the features that they, that they offer. For example, there's quite a few CNI providers, including AWS themselves. As platform engineers, it's important for us to map capabilities that we're going to build on to the vendor. Otherwise, we're just making things more complex, not simpler. So we can see it here with Istio, we use service discovery, L7 observability, and advanced traffic management. That's for things like routing a request based on the headers on that request. Uh, for Cilium, we use it for CNI, L3 and L4 observability, and namespace isolation. We'll get into that in, in, in the next few slides. Um, and for AWS, we use it for the EKS offering and the various VPC offerings. This makes migrations easier and the stack more maintainable overall. If we drill in a little bit further, we can see how these are all tied together. We can see at the bottom, Cilium and Cilium Cluster Mesh handle the CNI and workload identity. Um, next, we pure our VPCs to flatten the network, right in the middle here. Uh, and finally, up top, we're leveraging Istio for, with a multi-primary configuration to handle multi-region service discovery. This type of configuration makes active-active and active-passive configurations more manageable for product developers because of the built-in failover inherent in this approach. Let's take a deeper look at how that failover can work. Here we can see there's actually three moments where failover can happen. Failover the first being at the DNS level. If a DNS query fails, the request will automatically be routed to the healthy host if one exists. The second is an envoy failover at the edge of each cluster that tenants can optionally configure. Finally, at the Istio mesh level, the sidecar will automatically fail over if the workload reports unhealthy. You may be wondering why that last failover is even necessary. Let's take another look from, from a different angle to, to see how that could be useful. Here we can see that the mesh failover is quite useful for intra-cluster service-to-service communications. If a workload is degraded, the mesh failover will automatically proxy to the viable workload in the team's namespace with the same name in an alternative region. We'll get more into that in a second. 
keep in mind, without explicitly access, without explicit access grants, the proxy won't be able to happen in a namespace outside of the namespace that the tenant owns. This is thanks to Cilium's network policies, which Ahmed spoke about previously, um, which enabled the multi-tenancy aspect of the cluster. Let's change gears a bit and take a look at how Cilium network policies are maintained and automated. For keeping the policies in sync across clusters, we use a Kubernetes operator pattern to distribute the Cilium network policies which keep namespaces sandboxed. This keeps the security folks happy, but workloads within the cluster still need to be able to communicate with each other. Let's see what we can do about that. And here we can see this is the operator up top of the controller distributing the CMPs across all of our regions. As we saw on the previous slide, the controller manages the core Cilium network policies, which restrict namespaces by default. However, we also allow the users to define their own Cilium network policies to explicitly open up access to other tenants. It's important to note that Cilium network policies must pass through an admission controller to ensure that they're only altering the namespace that they're allowed to be, or rather they're only within the, the policy itself. This combination of Cilium and Istio are powerful as they allow for a granular service-to-service -service authorization capabilities. Let's take a look at how a tenant may configure a service to work with these authorization policies. Here we are building on top of the first layer, Cilium, and introduce the Istio layer, which is using its authorization policy. This handles both internal and external authorization to free up applications of any validation business logic, since it's handled completely within the Istio sidecar. Writing this can be fairly error prone and not the most user friendly thing to do. Um, so we have abstracted it to look a little something like this. This then gets translated into the appropriate CRDs. Um, and with this, tenants are, more, are able to leverage the complex networking policies at a lower level with a fairly simple abstraction. Now I'm going to take a moment and talk about some opportunities we've identified for improvement. In general, reasons for consolidation in computer science is pretty obvious, um, but I think it's important to call out. Um, it's a smaller blast radius for us to maintain. Um, it allows us to lean more heavily on eBPF, aka Cilium in this case. Um, and overall, uh, it's simpler management, easier to upgrade things if we can consolidate them more. So in order to do that, we have identified two main things that we're looking to try to consolidate, which are replacing Istio multi-primary with Cilium global services. Um, and replacing Istio virtual services for L7 Cilium with L7 uh, Cilium configuration. Now I'm gonna pass it back to Ahmed to take us out with some key uh, takeaways. Thank you, Beat. So this is the first diagram that I showed around like how the cluster and uh, all of the traffic are being uh, hosted in the cluster. So we're still like working on DNS level, multiple load balancers going through multiple invoices. And to make that simpler, I didn't add uh, STU sidecars there just because like I couldn't find enough space in the uh, chart. Then we moved from that layer to a simpler layer where like we have an external ingress gateway that takes or traffic uh, load balancers that takes all of the traffic coming from outside of the cluster through DNS and then like send all of that to Envoy and then from Envoy directly to the workload. So with this makes like less, when, when we think about it, like it doesn't, it doesn't help like tremendously on latency. The, the problem is not latency. It's more about simplification on the amount of hops that your traffic is going through. So instead of like going through multiple layers of Envoy, TLS termination, different like load balancers, now we are going from like one load balancer to envoy to the uh, workload. However, there are still beasts here that it's missing, where like we are still going from like an ingress to envoy to another envoy on the STU sidecar. With the failover with all of the STU sidecars on the clusters, that's another piece of abstraction that we want to get out 
from our setup. So we want to ensure that like we have a singular invoice that does all of the ingress traffic and also do all of the L7 traffic routing between all of the workloads. So we are not there yet, but we are trying to get there, but like simplifying the process and make it much easier. So what we learned so far, make it simple because I ran into problems and everyone who runs Cilium's and Kubernetes networking runs into problems and once you add more components to your setup, you have more debugging tools that you need to add to your stack and just simplify it as much as you can, even if it started a little bit harder, just try to simplify it down the road. User experience is very important. So when we look at one easy thing as a platform engineer or as, a, as a, like someone who works with Cilium on a day-to-day, -day, you understand really what is a Cilium network policy look like and you can define it easily. But when you, you start to talk as platform engineer to your product engineering teams and you start saying like, hey, there's like this Cilium network policy, there's cube DNS, there's this workload, there's TLS, there's MTLS, all of that kind of stuff it gets pretty complex and they don't have to worry about all of that kind of stuff. So as B showed us earlier, like I'm deploying a Helm chart. I just need to service A to talk to service B. That's all I care about as an engineer. If I'm running the network, that's a different story, but like the user doesn't really need to know like all of the things behind unless they are a power user and they want to dive deeper and like they have an edge use case. So user experience is pretty important even if it's in a complex situation like the network stack. And then that iterative approach works best because at this layer, when we started super early, we have like multiple load balancers. I think like most of the clusters have SDU side cars, like most of the containers, I don't remember the exact number, but like we have half of our containers SDU side car and the other half is applications. So it just like the footprint of SDU is like drastically uh, decreased by like some of the configurations that we are doing. We also reduce the number of hops between like SDU side cars, the ingress, all of the kind of traffic that we are going through on the cluster. So it's okay to start like a little bit complex in a way, but like you know how to get and remove things out of the way once you start like making sim things simpler for your engineers. How is that? That's a wrap. So thank you everyone and would like to hear your feedback on the survey. We do have time for a couple questions if anybody has one. Uh, thank you very much for the great talk. I have one question regarding the network policies that you're having for users. So we are talking about people not having to care more than service A talk with service B, right? So I think like what is happening usually when we start applying a large number of network policies is that it gets very hard to debug and to test, right? So I wanted to know if you had any framework for testing and having some like dry run of your global network policies so that you don't get into situations where dependency management is, is becoming a very hard and impossible to do. Sure, I, I can talk to one aspect of that. We have, we have several tests when we're working on a test suite that is when we stand up a new cluster, it will validate everything's working as it expects that we expect it to work. Um, and that's kind of at the lower level. Um, and there's a more interesting thing that we started to adopt recently for our tenants that are using Helm charts um, to, to develop or to deploy their applications, we're actually using Helm unit testing to test the policies and ensure that whichever way they write them is actually creating the policies that we expect and we can assert on those. Um, so those are two different like layers that we're doing those testings. Um, one is more uh, preemptive and the other one's more reactive. I can't think of anything else. Yeah, the, this is from a user perspective. However, like as a platform, like we depend on Hubble for all of the use cases where like we try to debug like how the network requests are going around. Uh, so like we keep all of our flow logs in between and like we have a controller 
most of the network policies are done programmatically, so they are not done by hand. So it's either like through a controller which spits out like some default policies, or through a Helm chart which templates something specifically. But other than that, like we use Hubble to track all of the flows happen between services and understand like what's being dropped, what's being allowed. So we we debug this, but we still like early in the process on providing this capability to tenants to understand like is my traffic is being blocked between this service to that service. We're not there yet. We are doing this on the higher level on the cluster side, uh, but we're looking forward to do something like that in like a CLI tool or something might be say, hey, do I have access to that? Things similar to kubectl auth, can, can I do that? So maybe something that can I access that and spits out like, yes, you can, no, you can't. You mentioned that you have the component to make it really easy for the developer teams to manage the connectivity, the CNPs. Um, is that a Helm chart that you're providing or is it part of the controller? And as a follow-up, um, is that controller open source or planned to be open source? Um, I can speak quickly to that. So it's two things, both of what you mentioned. Um, we do have a controller that, if we think back to the slides, that manage the core CMPs. These are the things that kind of keep those, those tenants isolated or sandboxed. Um, and it can, you know, we have a CRD that, that the tenant will launch a CRD into and then that will parse it and change certain things with the policies, but the tenants can also change it themselves and they do so via a Helm chart. Um, so I would say both. And I don't think there's any plans to open source the controller right now. It's pretty, uh, specific to what we're doing, but maybe in the future. Okay, great. Thanks for your talk. Um, it's now we're breaking for lunch.